Yesterday, I told you that I was going to do my best to ignore the Democrats' January 6th histrionics and instead focus on the actual feast. It was Little Christmas, the Feast of the Epiphany. I mostly succeeded at that, but I, I made a slip up. And, and now I fear that my face is stuck in a permanent state of cringe. I, I knew I shouldn't have watched it, but I saw across my computer screen that Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats had invited the cast of Hamilton to their struggle session to sing them a song about how great they all are. We are all stewards of the American experiment, working to pass down to our children and our grandchildren a more perfect union that treats all its citizens with fairness and equity. I'm dedicating every day to you. Domestic life was never quite my style. When you smile, you knock me out, I fall apart. And I thought I was so smart. You will come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. If we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you and you'll blow us all away. Someday, someday. Yeah, you'll blow us all away. Someday, someday. Uh, <laughs> what Nancy Pelosi and Lin-Manuel Miranda and the rest of the Democrats have done to us is far, far more violent than what any of the alleged insurrectionists did last year on January 6th. I'm Michael Knowles, this is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from VJS, who says, just asking for a friend, but isn't it kind of racist to not give BLM an anniversary for any of their riots? Such a good point. White supremacy wins again, except it's a little complicated because some of the alleged white supremacist insurrectionists were not white at all. There were plenty of black people and Hispanic people at, at the Capitol. And a lot of the BLM rioters were extremely pasty Antifa people. So it doesn't really break down quite on perfectly on ra racial lines. But yes, I agree. I think that's a great example of white supremacy. And that's not good for our future. When you want to plan for your future, I would strongly recommend you check out Alto IRA. Do you have an account with Coinbase? Are you thinking of opening one? Are you crypto curious? I am. I hadn't really been that interested in crypto. And then recently, I've just completely gotten into it with the NFTs and the, the Ethereum and the meme coins and all this stuff. Well, Crypto may very well represent the future of money. It's certainly a very important new technology. And so everyone's really getting involved and they're getting investing in it and trading it. And like so many things in life, there's a smart way to do it and a dumb way to do it. The really smart way to do it is to go check out Alto IRA so that you can invest in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano in a tax-advantaged IRA. Super easy to set up. You can invest with as little as 10 bucks, no setup charges. This is industry-leading security the advanced encryption standard for wallets and private keys, multiple ways to fund your account. You can do it with cash, uh, cash contribution, transfer cash from an existing IRA, roll over an old 401k. Are you ready to take your investments to the next level? Diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches. Open an Alto crypto IRA with as little as 10 bucks. Go to altoira.com slash Michael. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A.com slash M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Start investing in crypto today. Altoira.com slash Michael. I said yesterday that I was going to ignore the Democrats' histrionics, and I did. I really, I didn't watch Joe Biden's stupid speech. I assume it's stupid. I was told it was a very stupid speech. I didn't watch it. I didn't watch MSNBC and CNN and all of the histrionics. Instead, I enjoyed the Feast of the Epiphany. It was, it was lovely. The reason that I didn't pay attention to the Dems' histrionics is because the Capitol riot, such as it was, is not a significant event in itself. It's not. It did, it's not even the most significant insurrection of the year leading up to it. 
<laughs> that, that would have been BLM and Antifa, killing dozens of people, attacking federal buildings, <laughs> looting, rioting, burning down, and pillaging at different cities. However, the, the reason I mention Lin-Manuel Miranda and Nancy Pelosi and all the rest of them is because January 6th could be an extremely historically important event as a myth. Not in what happened. What happened at the Capitol really doesn't matter at all. There was, there was one person killed in the violence of that day, and it was one of the alleged insurrectionists being killed by a trigger-happy cop, right? So what the, what the rioters did, that, that doesn't really matter. But the mythology that is coming out of this, that, that really could matter, okay? The myth is why Nancy Pelosi hired Broadway performers to come down and dramatize the whole incident. If the event itself were sufficiently dramatic to, to warrant some place of significance in American history, then you would just have a report from the January 6th committee and you would just have them recount the events and you would talk about all the police officers who were killed and all of the, the government that was overturned and you would talk about it, except none of that happens, so they can't talk about it. So they have to invite actual actors to come down and, and dramatize the event and sing a song explicitly about how great Nancy Pelosi and the rest of the Democrats are. That's the whole song. And you'll blow us all away. You're going to shape our country. Lin-Manuel Miranda says it at the beginning. He says, you're doing, you're standing up and we need to stand with you. And you're so great and you're so wonderful. And then you have all these geriatric, demo, mostly geriatric Democrats who saying, yes, we are good. Our legacy is good. And they're smart and they're smart and they're doing a really, really good job of this because myth matters in politics. Myth matters in politics and statecraft often more than history does. The myth is much more important. Kamala Harris came out. She compared the Capitol riot last year to not just Pearl Harbor, but September 11th as well. Good morning. Certain dates echo throughout history, including dates that instantly remind all who have lived through them, where they were and what they were doing when our democracy came under assault. Dates that occupy not only a place on our calendars, but a place in our collective memory. December 7th, 1941, September 11th, 2001, and January 6th, 2021. On that day, I was not only vice president-elect, I was also a United States senator. This comparison is deeply offensive. You know, some of us knew people who died on September 11th, okay? Some, it wasn't that long ago. A lot of people remember it, especially people around New York, especially those who are millennials or older might remember this. To compare 3,000 Americans being killed in a terrorist attack to the horn guy dancing around the Capitol Rotunda is really disgusting and is genuinely extremely offensive, but it's got a point. It's got a political point. January 6th is a myth. It is completely made up. If, if not completely made up, it's 99% made up. It's based on an actual riot that took place at the Capitol, but virtually everything you've been told about it is a lie and has been turned proven to be a lie. And even some newspapers had to retract it, though no one was paying any attention to the retraction. So the, the lies persist. All countries have myths. How was Rome founded? Rome, you know, Rome, the Roman Republic becomes the Roman Empire. How was it founded? There are two stories about how Rome was founded. One is that it was founded by Aeneas, right? Aeneid, like the Aeneid, like the, the poem by Virgil, and it was founded after the Trojan War. And the other is Romulus and Remus. And these are related myths, but it was founded by Romulus and Remus, these two boys who were, who were fed and raised by a she-wolf. And then they, they form the civilization and Romulus kills Remus. I'm simplifying a little bit. But those are the stories. Did that happen in real life? I don't know, probably not. But that's the myth, and the myth is the identity of Rome. It's much more important than whatever council met and wrote some document together and took the many, many steps that very slowly created what became Rome. No, Romulus and Remus, that matters a whole lot more. Nash, even, even modern countries like our own country have national myths, and some are true and some are not true. George Washington, 
What's his relationship to a cherry tree? Every schoolboy knows this, or at least used to know this when we taught the American myths, that George Washington chopped down a cherry tree, but he could not tell a lie, so he admitted that he chopped down the cherry tree. Did this happen? No, but it's part of the myth of America, and it, and it forms a lot of our identity, and it forms our understanding of our past and our forebears and who we are ourselves. January 6th, with all the scare music and all the hyperventilating and all the pearl clutching, that is now part of the American myth. The Democrats are desperate to establish that one. And so they're going to have festivals every year and they're going to have big speeches and they're going to have big solemn celebrations. They're probably going to erect a statue. They're going to have Broadway performers do songs and dances to it. Lies shape history just as much as the truth very often. There's a UCLA professor named Kara Cooney. She's an Egyptologist and a social historian who focuses on gender theory and gender studies. So, you know, she's going to be a real treat. This UCLA professor just published a book about Egypt that for whatever reason wrote or included a passage about Kyle Rittenhouse. Kyle Rittenhouse, the kid who was getting chased by the Antifa guys in Kenosha, Wisconsin and shot them. And what she says about Kyle Rittenhouse is that Kyle Rittenhouse you, quote, used his semi-automatic weapon to kill two black men in Kenosha, Wisconsin, while waging a glorious race war on behalf of his inherited white power. This is a book about Egypt. And it's just not true. It's not, the people that, that Kyle Rittenhouse killed were not black. They were white guys. They were extremely pasty white guys. And, and Kyle Rittenhouse was not waging a race war, and there's no evidence of that whatsoever. It's completely made up. But if you went and asked people on the street right now, hey, what happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin? I bet if they'd heard of it at all, I bet you 99 out of 100 would say, oh, some white supremacist kid killed some black people. That's what you would hear. And in part, that's because these myths are being pushed by very influential people, by our educators, even educators at very prestigious universities. Now, when you want to help save the country, not just the cultural aspects of the country, but the financial aspects, your own dollar, you know, charity starts at home. What do you got to check out? You got to check out GetUpside. If you are not currently using GetUpside, you are a dummy. I don't know how else to put it, okay? GetUpside is free money at the tank at a time when gas is going through the roof. How does it work? You sign up with the free GetUpside app in the App Store or Google Play. Right now, use the promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. You will get 25 cents cash back for each gallon of gas that you buy. You're you're probably thinking, Michael, that's not true. I'll tell you what, it's actually not true. It's not true because on your first fill up, you will get 50 cents cash back per gallon. This is an unbelievable opportunity. It's a wonderful app. It's free to download. Get Upside right now. There's no catch, just cash back. You can get that cash back directly into your bank account or with PayPal or with an Amazon gift card or some other gift cards. Super easy, really great time, especially after the holidays when we've all spent all of our money. Head on over, get upside right now. Use promo code Knowles. Get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. That is code Knowles. This UCLA professor, Kara Cooney, who published a book on Egypt, and it completely lied about Kyle Rittenhouse. Why she was talking about Kyle Rittenhouse, no one knows. But she, she said that Kyle Rittenhouse killed these black people, and he was raging a race war on behalf of white power. She got called out on this. Someone found the book somehow. I assume it's just because she assigned it to her students. No one reads these obscure academic books that the professors publish just to maintain their own jobs. But someone found it, and so she tweets out, quote, on page 341 of The Good Kings, I state that Kyle Rittenhouse shot two black men when instead he shot two white men. That was my mistake, and I apologize. The response has been a hateful stew of ridicule and denial that America has a race problem at all. If one mistake in a little-known book about ancient Egypt elicits this much howling, it is to avoid discussing our larger problem, to avoid seeing our deep-seated obsession with patriarchal power. First thing I noticed here is this woman who is a professor at a prestigious university who is apparently such a sloppy historian that she doesn't check basic facts of events that she's writing about, events that have nothing to do with the ostensible subject of her book. I noticed that she doesn't know how to spell deep-seated. It's deep-seated, like you're sitting down in a chair, like seated. But she wrote seated, like Johnny Appleseed, like you're going out into your garden. 
which is, I guess it's a minor point, but it, it reveals a greater problem, <laughs> which is that our academics, the people who are teaching our kids today, even at expensive fancy schools, are not particularly bright or well-educated. It's a side point. Though it does speak to the bigger problem here. She gets caught. She published this total lie. She gets called out on it. She smears this young man. She gets called out on it and she says, look, yeah, okay, that part was false, but it gets to a greater truth. Yes, no, it's true. There wasn't a white supremacist kid shooting black guys to wage a race war in Kenosha, but it gets to the greater truth of our awful white supremacist country and the race war that's being waged. No, it doesn't. It, it's just a lie. It's a lie. You peddled a narrative and it was false and you got called out on it and you don't want to admit that you were wrong. Lies do not get to greater truths. The libs do this every time you call them on their BS. They say, well, okay, so that, yeah, that turned out not to be true, but it gets to a greater truth. No, it doesn't. It's just lies. And, and there are a lot more lies even than you get called out on. Does anyone really believe right now in the year of our Lord, 2022 in the United States, that America has a pervasive problem of white supremacy, that, that the prevailing culture is one in which it is encouraged to insult and attack black people and, and to uh, exalt white people? Is that really the racial culture we're living in right now? Last time I checked, white people are the only group that you're allowed to legally discriminate against. That's not true. There's the exception of Asians. You're also allowed to discriminate against Asians in certain instances. But mostly it's white people. You can discriminate against them in uh, college admissions. You can discriminate against them in employment. Beyond the law, if you just look at the, you can discriminate against them in certain grants and cer certain uh, funding. But beyond that, even just in terms of the culture, the only group, the only racial group that you're allowed to and encouraged to insult are, is white people. And it's commonplace to insult white people and talk about how awful white people are and how they've caused all sorts of problems. If you ever insulted black people or Hispanic people or a even Asian people who are in this strange category where they can be legally discriminated against, but if you insulted them in the culture, you would be ostracized. You would be booted out of polite society. You would be, you would be censored, and a lot of people are. So it's just not true. The, the greater truth that she's talking about is just a complete lie, as are the things that she's stating. When we're talking about racial politics, one of the clearest examples of this today in public life is Joy Reid. Joy Reid on MSNBC. Joy Reid was discussing the January 6th myth, and she, like everyone else in the liberal establishment, was trying to firmly establish this as part of the American mythology. And she said that, that Joe Biden is going to address January 6th, and he is getting a ton of hate from Republicans. And she's so shocked by this, because it seems that Joe Biden's getting just about as much hate as Barack Obama. So tomorrow, President Biden is going to speak. And there's a question of whether or not he actually can change this or he can he can alter it at all because unbelievably he has become for republicans as much of a uh, sort of figure of hatred a hate object as president obama was you know the, the black president like i mean he was his vice president maybe that's part of it i don't know what it is but this is like the most sort of norm core democrat ever it's so strange it doesn't make any sense Joe Biden's getting as much hate as Barack Obama, but those Republicans only hated Obama because he's black, and yet they hate Joe Biden just as much. I guess it's got to be because Joe Biden's kind of black. That's, that's her conclusion, effectively. I'm only slightly exaggerating. She's saying that Republicans, it doesn't make any sense that Republicans would be just as hard on this Democrat president as they were on the last Democrat president. Because her premise is that they only hated the last Democrat president, not because of his political views or all the terrible things he did, but because of the color of his skin. So the only way to resolve this tension, there are two ways. She could either recognize that Republicans did not hate Obama because he was black. They didn't like Barack Obama because he was a jerk and a terrible president and did all sorts of horrible things. Or she could conclude that Joe Biden is somehow kind of black or is associated. Joe Biden, who's a very white guy, is somehow kind of sort of black. When reality runs contrary to the racial narrative, her answer is to change reality. That Joe Biden is a black guy. And, and not to put too fine a point on it, but it's not just that Republicans don't like Biden as much as they didn't like Obama. 
They seem to like him considerably less than they liked Obama. There's a new poll out. It's from Civics. A job approval poll shows that Biden's job approval rating, which was already extremely low, it was at 38 or 37 percent. It's now dropped down to 35 percent. This is just after Biden received a record high disapproval rating of 56 percent. Really, really bad stuff. Biden's net approval rating right now is negative 20. Really bad news for Biden, especially heading into the midterms and then looking ahead to 2024. This is why you are getting all the January 6th stuff. I guarantee you, if Joe Biden were popular right now, if the Democrats had anything that they could run on, anything, they don't have a single thing. They're, they're below water on every single issue. If they had anything they could run on, you'd probably get some histrionics about January 6th, but you wouldn't get nearly as much. They wouldn't be so desperate to enshrine that in the national mythology. But because they got nothing, they, they need to use January 6th. And it's one for this cultural reason of, of establishing Republicans as terrorists in people's minds. But it's also for a very practical reason. They're pushing for a federal takeover of elections. Republicans are calling this bill that they're pushing the Corrupt Politicians Act. It was the first bill that they took up in the new House of Representatives and in the Senate when the Democrats took control. Because they know that if, while they now have unified government and they control the whole thing, if they can take power to govern elections away from the states, away from local governments, give it to themselves, take away all of the safeguards that prevented them from or or impeded them from stealing elections and enshrine their new rules, no voter ID, widespread unsolicited mail-ins, election day turns into election month, all that kind of stuff. If they can enshrine that, then they believe that they're going to give themselves a permanent electoral majority. So it all ties in together. There's the really abstract stuff about the national mythos, but there's also the really practical stuff. They want to pass this law. Why do they want to do it? Because according to the Democrats, according to Pete Buttigieg, everyone's favorite transportation secretary, democracy is sacred. Democracy is sacred. That's what he tweeted out on January 6th. Democracy. In his super duper glib Pete Buttigieg, Harvard educated, worked at McKinsey, just the most glad handing, shallow individual you've ever met. In his in that tone, you can hear it. Democracy is sacred. Democracy is not sacred. Democracy is not sacred. And Pete Buttigieg and the Democrats are some of the least likely people to believe democracy is sacred. That's why they're upending so many of the safeguards to protect our democracy on the election integrity laws, and also in terms of how laws are passed and how our government works. They're trying to take a lot of power away from the people and away from the states and give it to unelected bureaucrats. If they could crown Dr. Fauci as the emperor of the country indefinitely, right now they would do it. They effectively have done that. So I don't want to hear anything about democracy from these people. They don't like it very much. The conservatives are far greater defenders of democracy. And furthermore, democracy is not in itself sacred. Democracy is a nice form of government. We like democracy. But there are other forms of government that can be good too. This is what is described by the ancients as the cycle of regimes. There are according to this theory, three good forms of government and three bad forms of government, and they relate to one another. Democracy can be great, but democracy can be really bad too. We call that mob rule. The founding fathers were very afraid of it. Aristocracy can be great. There have been good aristocracies in the history of our civilization, but aristocracy can be really bad. That's when it becomes oligarchy. That's increasingly what our own government looks like. Monarchies can be great. There have been great monarchies in the history of the West. Some of the greatest governments in the history of the West, have been monarchies. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. Uh, it's, a, it's a monarchy. But there can be ba- a bad version of monarchies, which is tyranny. That's when you have some tin pot dictator. There are good versions and bad versions. And what the, the libs are trying to convince us all of now is that we're living under some shining, perfect democracy. And they're going to take us even further in that direction. They're not. We are living practically under an oligarchy, and they are taking us much further in that direction, and they're trying to pass laws at this very second that are going to make our government more oligarchical, more easily controlled by a small group of people who are in government, who are in private business, who are working in the media, and they're all working in cahoots with one another to keep the people down. It's as simple as that. Just when you think that the Democrats in office, actual mainstream Democrats, cannot get 
more transparently hypocritical. They do something like this. In the liturgical season of January 6th, where they're trying to convince us that Republicans are traitors and insurrectionists and they're trying to overturn our government and, and they're evil people who need to be ostracized from society and they hate their fellow man. A Democrat city council member in Portland, Maine, has just been found selling a sticker at one of his businesses that says, abort Republicans. Abort. He's selling other stickers too. He's selling a sticker that says, Def- defund God, lowercase g too. Uh, Thank you for making me a godless hoe. And are we sluts? This is at, at his, at his uh, coffee shop. This was reported first by the Post Millennial. Shows you where the real power is. It goes without saying, if a Republican did anything like this, if we had stickers that we were selling saying, kill Democrats, we would be arrested, we'd be thrown in Guantanamo Bay, we'd probably be in the solitary confinement cell right next to the horn guy and right next to the dad who was popping a Coors Light in the Capitol Rotunda during that, that most world historic day in the history of our nation. Shows you where the real power is. The power is almost entirely with Democrats, Democrats working in cahoots with the liberal establishment, the media, the universities, the woke corporations, the big technology. They, they control basically everything. And what they will do is project. And the things that they are doing themselves, they will accuse us of doing. They do this on racial matters. They do this on sexual matters. They do this on matters of politics and government. Where's the power really lie? Where's the, where are the real threats to democracy? Speaking of excuses, got to get to this. Eric Swalwell, our favorite. Eric, the man who is nearly president. Congressman Eric Swalwell, who is best known for uh, having a, a bodily function on television news and for sleeping with a Chinese spy. Eric Swalwell has been really tough on conservatives for not following the public health orders and listening to Dr. Fauci and going along with with the COVID mania. He tweeted out, quote, as we end 2021, this was just a, a week or so ago, as we end 2021 mired in a deadly pandemic, you should know who has prolonged it. These guys, Republican liars, your vacation canceled, your kids back to virtual learning and back to masks everywhere. For blame, look no further than these guys talking about Republicans. And then what happens? What happens? We catch uh, Eric Swalwell without a mask on. He was down in Florida. He was not wearing a mask. We've done this a billion times. We've caught all of these Democrats, Fauci himself, Maxine Waters, Pelosi, Warren, the mayor of San Francisco, AOC. We caught all these people not wearing masks when they're telling all the rest of us to wear masks. And so a photographer got a picture of it, published it, and Swalwell responds, and he doesn't say, I'm sorry. Oh, you no, actually, I, I didn't mean to. It was a one moment. No, he, he tweets out, quote, they got me, maskless, juggling a baby and a coffee while meeting with a Congolese queen. Pulitzer, please. He's making fun of the journalist. He's saying they deserve a Pulitzer. I can't tell by by the phrase Congolese queen if he means that he's meeting actually with a Congolese queen or if he's just using it in the modern sense of the word, like this is just a Congolese woman and he's sort of yes queen. I don't know. I don't know which one would be funnier. Either way, Swalwell got caught in the hypocrisy and he's unrepentant. He's shameless about it. He's not, he doesn't even practice the hypocrisy, which is what the, the tribute that vice pays to virtue. He's not even saying, oh no, actually you're misunderstanding, you don't get it. No, he's saying, no, there's one set of rules for me, there's one set of rules for you. Look, I had good intentions, and so we're going to judge me, and we're going to judge my friends, the Democrats, by our intentions, and we're going to judge you, Republicans, by your actions, and the worst way that I could possibly depict your actions. It's whatever Swalwell or or Pelosi or Biden or Kamala or Fauci or any of the rest of them, whatever they want to do is fine as long as they've got a good reason, as long as they have a good excuse. And whatever you want to do is not fine because you have to submit to their whims. Speaking of different standards, there's a story out of Yale, Yale University. I am really sorry to say at, at the forefront of wokeness and the destruction of the American university and other elite institutions. Yale has now announced that students can return to campus anytime between January 14th and February 4th, but they must quarantine in their residences 
except to pick up food and to take COVID tests constantly. And maybe to take academic tests? No, I assume that's online too. Until they receive the results of an arrival test. Uh, Yale has instituted this campus-wide quarantine until uh, February 7th, and the students may not visit New Haven businesses or eat at local restaurants, even outdoors. They can maybe go for curbside pickup, but they can't really participate at all in the community. They've got to lock up in their dorm rooms. What this is about is not just idiocy, is not just an overreaction, is not just an unscientific policy. It's about a consolidation of power. I have a personal connection to this story because I once quarantined at Yale. When I was an undergraduate, I had the swine flu. That was the, that was the big problem that was going around the country then. And so I, got, I think it was the swine flu, whatever the big flu was that year. I got it. They made me quarantine. What did that mean? It meant I was supposed to stay in my room. But that's not what kids do at college. You know what kids do at college? They do a lot of bad things they shouldn't be doing. Okay, and especially at that campus, by the way. What do you think is going to happen? You get kids who have COVID and they're going to go into their college dorms, their co-ed college dorms on one of the booziest campuses in the entire country. And they're, what are they, they're just going to sit quietly in their rooms? You think that's what's going to, no, I think they're going to spread COVID and maybe a few other illnesses as well. Okay. So what's the point of this? The point is the separation. The point is that these elite Yale students, they can't go and pick up the nasty germs at the local New Haven shops. Ugh, they might meet some townsfolk. Ugh, could you imagine? Get their filthy, disgusting peasant germs on them. That wouldn't be good. No, we've all got to stay separate. And we're going to stay in our corner. You're going to stay in your corner, and we're all just going to order Amazon, and we're all just going to live in the metaverse, and we're all just going to keep to ourselves and live in our own little chambers. And, and what we once considered civil society what we once considered to be our real politics, which is you go out and you see people and you engage in the community, that's going away. And one of the reasons that's going away, I know this sounds crazy and kooky and conspiratorial, but if, if you don't think that there is a major political power grab going on after the last two years, I don't know how to help you. What is happening here is that the few remaining impediments to a consolidation of the power of the liberal establishment are being demolished. And that is small businesses and that is local communities, and that is families, these things are being demolished. And you can, you can quantify it. It's happening in real time. And it's no coincidence that the elite institutions are at the head of it. Today's a really big day. Today is a really big day because the Daily Wire is suing the Biden administration. The Supreme Court has convened to hear oral arguments in this case about the constitutionality and the legality of Joe Biden's mask mandate. We've already got over a million signatures on our do not comply petition. Keep signing. Keep signing. We need to send a message. The court reads public opinion. (laughs) The court reads the polls. Sign up. Add your name. Send it to your friends. Dailywire.com slash do not comply. We'll be right back with the mailbag. Welcome back to the mailbag. So good. So good to be with all of you. My favorite time of the week. First question up from Sarah. Hey, short question today. What do you think will happen to the horn guy and other people who the left wants to burn at the January 6th stake? I think they're going to have the book thrown at them. That's already happening. Some have been held in solitary confinement. Some have been held in really terrible conditions. And if I were president right now, if I were in any position of power to help these people, I would. I would consider pardoning them outright, I would commute a lot of their sentences. And if I were in some position to deal with the details of the prosecution, I would seriously diminish the charges against them. Obviously, it would be on a case-by-case basis. You'd have to see what people were doing. But I would, I would dramatically reduce the charges against them. Why would I do that? Is it because I'm soft on crime now? Is it because I merely want to reward my friends and punish my enemies? No, it's because what happened to them is deeply unfair. The BLM terrorists who actually killed people, the BLM terrorists who burned the country down for eight months and attacked federal buildings, an assault on our democracy, and who 
looted and robbed and pillaged and burned. Those guys largely got off the hook. When you look specifically at the Bronx and Manhattan, the vast majority of them just had their cases dismissed or pled down basically to nothing. And so we cannot live in a country where the left gets off the hook for very egregious violence and the right has the book thrown at them and they rot in a jail cell for relatively minor infractions. We can't live in that country. Now you might say, well, it would be better if both of them were punished a lot. Okay, yeah, maybe it would. Okay, maybe, I guess, I don't know. What I do know is that the left has already been let off the hook. And so as a matter of justice, not just as a matter of po- good politics, but as a matter of justice, I would, I, would, I would let the horn guy out of his cell if he's still there. I don't know that he's still there. But I would, I would dramatically reduce the, the charges against, against the alleged insurrectionists when I, wouldn't, when, when I wouldn't just let them off the hook entirely. And then the, le- the left can learn their lesson. And then maybe the left will stop going so light on the crime when their own guys commit it. And then maybe we can return to some normal semblance of government. But we're, n- we're not going to get back to good government by letting the left get away with murder, literally murder in some cases, and throwing the book at the conservatives. From Quentin, hey Michael, I have a question. This might be dumb. What is the Christian view on anime girl pillows? Huh? Hypothetically speaking, if one were to use it as a sleep aid, like for sleep, who would that be wrong? On one hand, it's a pillow, so it should not be a problem. On the other hand, there is an anime girl on it, so it might be considered wrong. Keep in mind, this is only hypothetical. I'm going to do something. I usually don't have a computer in front of me, but we were snowed home over the past few days, so I I usually keep note cards. I don't like having screens in front of me during the show, but I do have a computer, which means that I'm, hold on, I'm going to put on my, like, my ExpressVPN right now. I can't, I don't want to have this typed into my Google history. Anime girl pillow. What is an anime? Okay, well, that makes sense. It's just a pillow of an anime girl, but they're long. It's like a full body pillow. Okay, well, if, if you have this pillow, Quentin, because you just really like the artwork and you just really appreciate the art and the beauty of the anime girl pillow, I guess that's fine. A little weird, but fine. Uh, if you have this full lady-sized cartoon lady pillow that you hold in your sleep for some less wholesome reason, that would not be fine. That would be probably a near occasion of sin and appeal to the prurient interest and throw out the pillow, buddy. Don't, that's, don't have the pillow. That's, I've, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm changed my mind. Just no, just no, no pillows. None of that. Sarah, Dear Michael, how do you find happiness? Oh, just that little question? Happiness is not a guarantee in this life, but I believe that you can always find it regardless of the circumstances in your life. Uh, What advice do you have to find happiness when you're you're feeling anything but? I actually do have a direct answer to this, uh, which is, and the, the ancients who we keep invoking, those ancient Greeks have an answer too, which is that we want to order our life toward happiness, toward true happiness, toward the life well lived, which is not merely subjective and about our own personal preferences and tastes, but is an objective standard. There are good things that you can do. There is such a thing as virtue, for instance, and excellence. And the way we attain that is by practicing the virtues, which is not merely moral. It's not just do good things and, and, and avoid com- committing sins, but it, it has other aspects to it. It means excellence more broadly. So it would be working out, something that I don't do very much, but that would, that would be one way to be happier is if you, if you treat your body well and you eat healthy foods and you do good things. It would be to attain wisdom. That will make you happier. It will be to cultivate your courage. That would be something that would make you happier. And it would be to practice the virtues and do good and avoid evil. That will make you happier. Now, bad things will still happen to you, which is why the p- pure cultivation of virtue is not going to be sufficient in the end. It's why you need to know your God, because any understanding of what is good that is divorced from God is not going to make a lot of sense, and it's not going to be satisfying. So it's very helpful to know that even as you're cultivating the virtues and doing your best and doing the best you can, it's helpful to know, for instance, that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Some religions don't recognize that. Christianity does recognize that. You can be doing great things and bad things can happen to you. And it's not necessarily God punishing you. Actually, it can be 
good for you. It can be edifying. It can be sanctifying. And you have to recognize that you're not made merely for this world, that you are going to die. At a certain point, no matter how well you cultivate the virtues, you're going to die. And so you're going to have a sad end in that regard. That's the, that is the consequence of sin and death pervading the world. But there is redemption. There is salvation. And one great way to be happy is to recognize the fact that your Redeemer lives. And, and so you, you can't avoid it. I know that there are lots of uh, people who are not very religious who listen to this show. And I appreciate your patience with me because I bring up religion a fair bit. But the reason I do it is you, you, can't, you can't avoid religion. You're not, you're not going to be able to, to think about politics or culture or just your own personal life without coming to religious questions because you come into this world, you don't really know how you got here. You, you know that there's no way to, get at, to, to live forever on this earth, that no one here gets out alive. We, we're so befuddled by our hopes and our joys and our loves and all of these, and sin and, and pain, and what does this all mean? And so you're going to have to get to some religious answers, and that will give you, that will give you a much better shot at happiness, and at true happiness. From Kemp, can you explain, Michael, why you can't just legislate morality? Why that is not a valid argument? I can. Although I think the burden really should be on you because you're the one making the claim, or not you specifically, but that this is what we're responding to, the claim that you can't legislate morality. So then I think my question is, why not? You're the one making this extraordinary claim. So why why is it that you can't? I think you can. Why can't you? Well, because people are, that's going to happen at the family level, and that's just from the culture, and the government has no say over it. You can't legislate morality. So in response to that, I guess what I would say is that I I guess we better get rid of murder laws, right? We have to, because you can't, that's a, if murder is not a moral issue, then what possibly could be? And you can't, you just said you can't legislate morality. Murders are going to murder, all right? Murderers just need to learn in their home not to murder. And they need to be taught by the culture not to murder. And so you can't have laws against it. So we'll get rid of the murder laws, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. What about uh, laws uh, against tax evasion? That's a, mor- that's a moral issue too. Different than murder, but no, you can't legislate. If someone wants to evade their taxes, they're just, they're going to do it. You know, and you, and you can't, the law cannot be an instructor, can it? Of course it can. The idea that you can't legislate morality is just modern day libertarian nonsense that no one in their right mind believed until about five minutes ago. (laughs) And you shouldn't believe it either. It's just a way for politicians to avoid the hard work of crafting laws. And it's a way to flatter the people and to allow them to participate in their most base desires and appetites. (laughs) And say, oh, well, you can't legislate morality. So go do whatever creepy, weird thing you want to do. And go do a bunch of drugs. And go, that's fine. It's just a way of evading responsibility. But of course the law is a teacher. Of course it is. You see this in the Bible. You see this in all serious political philosophy. You see this throughout the history of the United States. Of course, when you want less of something, you pass a law against it. If it were really the case that passing laws against bad things has no effect on how often they're committed, or maybe even has an inverse effect. Maybe you pass a law against it and it encourages the crime to be committed, then we would get rid of all of our laws. Then you wouldn't have laws against murder or tax evasion or anything because, well, no, that would be bad and, that, and, and it won't have any effect anyway and it might even have a bad effect. No, it's not. You pass laws against something, you get less of it generally. It, this is true, by the way, of the war on drugs as well. Often you'll hear the war on drugs was a failure. No, it wasn't. The war on drugs was super duper successful and drastically reduced the number of people doing illegal drugs from the 1970s to the 1990s. So that worked too. And then we abandoned it and then the, the drug use went back up and we should probably pass tougher drug laws too. That would be, that would be a rant in, in response to your question. I suppose I could put it in a pithier and, and more basic way, but that line, it just drives me so crazy. You can't legislate morality. The, the only one that rivals that line in terms of getting my blood up is that you, you can't teach, you shouldn't teach students what to think, only how to think. As though you could teach a student how to think about mathematics without teaching them that two plus two equals four. It's not possible, my friend. From Kyle. Michael, you've mentioned you have family in liberal New York. Yes, most of my family. So maybe you can help me. I'm in a group text thread with my wife and her sibling. They all work in the medical field. Some of the sisters have been voicing frustration with the COVID mandates and rules. However, my wife's brother keeps saying stuff like, it's literally just the science. (laughs) Gosh. Ugh, that's sad. 
it's sad that she married a a gender-confused individual such as that. Uh, Now, I would love to destroy him with facts and logic, but my wife really wants me to not start drama in our family text thread, so what should I do? Sincerely, Dante forgot the circle of hell dedicated to rabid COVID liberals. Good signature, actually, because this dilemma reminds me that angel, uh, that fools rush in, rather, where angels fear to tread. So your brother-in-law is, oh, okay, it's not, it's not the, that the sister married someone, it's your wife's brother. Okay, that's so, all right, at least a woman has not necessarily chosen this man to be her life partner and head of her household, because that would, that would be really sad. That would compound the problem. But what he's saying is, well, it's literally science, and you're a bunch of idiots if you don't take the 17th Fauci jab or whatever, you know, even though the, the science keeps changing day by day, often contradicting what was said the day before. He is going to be more likely to interject and spout off and mouth off and think that he is much smarter than everybody else. Often, the smartest people in the room are the most calm. You'll notice this in heated discussions. The people who really get angry and red in the face and steam coming out of their ears and screaming, they usually know less about what they're talking about (laughs) than everyone else in the discussion. And they're getting angry because they're getting frustrated because they can't articulate their views. So I would just let him mouth off. A family text thread is not a college debate. Family text thread is not owning someone with facts and logic on YouTube. What's, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the thread? It's to keep your family together and to have you all interact and talk. It's not to win arguments. It's not even to convince people of true things. So let him mouth off. Talk sense to a fool and he will call you foolish. I think Euripides said that. Last question from Brandon. Michael, I'm writing to you with a question in regard to doubt in my faith. I'm a Christian of roughly three years. I can't seem to shake this sort of internal nagging doubt. I listen to many intelligent Christians who are able to rationally explain faith and present good evidence for the reliability of the Gospels, but I just can't seem to quiet this internal doubt. Regardless of the doubt, I continue to pray daily, read my Bible, work toward becoming a stronger Christian. I wanted to know if you ever deal with this or how how you would respond. Yes, yes, We've, we've all had doubts. I was an atheist for 10 years. Uh, depending on your flavor of Christianity, I'm not sure what denomination you are, if you're Catholic or, or whatnot, some are a little more skeptical than others. And so uh, there are certain Christian friends of mine who will say, well, we can never really know for sure if God exists. Well, you know, it's just, we just got to take this leap and we don't, but you, you actually can. You can know the existence of God with certainty from the natural world by the light of human reason. Revelation plays a role as well in the faith and a very important role. But you, you can know just from the natural world, just using your own noggin, that God exists. And then there will be a lot of questions about God and the nature of God and the Trinity and Christ and Christianity and everything else. But, but just know, you, you can know the existence of God from the natural world. There are plenty of good arguments for this. You say you've dealt with some of these arguments. So you can have confidence in that. And just because the culture is discouraging you and just because you don't totally understand the nature of God, who by his very definition is incomprehensible, uh, that, that doesn't mean that you should just uh, uh, you know, throw your faith by the wayside or, or, or worry un- unnecessarily. There's a great story about St. Augustine, that St. Augustine was writing about the Trinity, and it's a legend, of course, but he's writing about the Trinity. He walks up, he sees a kid uh, using a clamshell and putting water into a little hole from the ocean. Augustine says, what are you doing? And the kid says, oh, I'm going to fill the whole ocean into this hole. And Augustine says, you can't do that. You can't fit the ocean in that hole. And then the boy miraculously is transformed into an angel, and he says, yeah, neither can you fit the Trinity into your little head, St. Augustine. And this legend, though it is, has a lot of, a lot of, uh, truth to it. Because, of course, God is by nature. If God were totally comprehensible by you, he he would not be God. So God does exist. You can trust that. Just as you might struggle to understand some aspect of, I don't know, calculus. How much more complicated? The divine logic of the universe. So persist. Keep at it. Keep praying. Don't be discouraged. Don't let the devil get you down. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you Monday. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. 
and hair and makeup by Cherokee Heart. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Hey everybody, this is Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon's turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the fall of the republic with me, Andrew Claven.